everybody. I'm here with our uh, second speaker here today, uh, Rupert Spira. Um, so Rupert has been deeply interested in the nature of reality and the source of lasting peace and happiness since an early age. After spending 20 years immersed in the teachings of classical Ayurveda Vedanta, he met his teacher, Francis the Sea, who introduced him to the direct path approach whereby it is possible to recognize the source of peace and happiness in oneself. Rupert has written several books and holds regular meetings and retreats online, as well as in Europe and the United States. He is also a noted potter, trained in the British Studio Pottery School, with work in public and private collections. You can keep up to date with his latest publications and works at www.rupertspira.com. And follow him on Twitter at Rupert Spira. So, Rupert, whenever you're ready, um, please feel free to get started. And it's absolutely brilliant to have you with us here today. Thank you, Niall, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. So, I would like to start with a provisional definition of consciousness. And I say, provisional because, as I will try to demonstrate, uh, I consider consciousness the ultimate reality of the universe and is, as such, that in terms of which everything else may be defined, but which cannot itself be defined in terms of anything else. Therefore, if we want to speak accurately about the nature of consciousness, we should really remain silent. As the Zen master once said, if I speak, I tell a lie. But after a brief pause, he continued, but if I remain silent, I am a coward. Why would one be a coward? if one refrained from speaking of these matters, because I would suggest that the most profound problems that humanity faces, the despair felt by many people, the conflict experienced between individuals, communities and nations, and the exploitation and degradation of the earth, all stem ultimately from our mistaken notion of the nature of reality. Therefore, although reality cannot be accurately spoken of, there is nothing more important to speak about. So I will attempt two definitions of consciousness. In fact, the first is not really a, a definition, but more of an evocation. That is an attempt to uh, evoke the recognition of consciousness and its nature in each of us, rather than to define it. In this respect, I would say simply that consciousness is that which knows or is aware of our experience. So let us take some time to explore this in our experience. Whatever we are experiencing, we are aware of it. The current thought, uh, the tingling sensation of our face or hands or feet or our legs on the chair, the sound of my voice, or the sight of our room. Whatever it is that knows our thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions is not itself a thought, feeling, sensation or perception. All of these experiences are unknown. We are aware of them. How come we are aware of them? Indeed, how come there is experience? What is it that knows or illuminates experience? 
that is consciousness or awareness. I use the words consciousness and awareness synonymously and, and sometimes the word knowing. Strangely, most people completely ignore the presence of consciousness or awareness in favor of the content of their experience. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, activities, relationships, and so on. How many people attending this gathering were ever asked by their parents, teachers, or professors what is it that knows or is aware of your experience? I have asked this question to literally thousands of people around the world and no one has ever answered in the affirmative. And yet, without consciousness, there would be no experience. Consciousness is as such that which makes all experience possible, but is not itself an experience. Just as, relatively speaking, the, the screen enables the movie, but never itself appears as an image in the movie. Is it not extraordinary that, uh, as a culture, we have almost universally ignored that through which, in which, and by which all experience is known. Indeed, until we know the nature of that with which everything is known, we cannot possibly know the nature of any particular thing, be that thing um, an atom, uh, a thought, or, or the universe. Strangely, until the presence of consciousness is noticed, it seems to be, to be the most mysterious and fleeting element of our experience. But after it is recognized, it becomes the most obvious, substantial element of experience. Everything that is known is filtered through the medium with which it is known and appears in accordance with its limitations. Can there be, therefore, any higher endeavour or more urgent an investigation than to know the nature of that with which and through which everything is known? It is inconceivable that one who spends her life painting in nature would overlook the presence of light. After all, without it there would be complete darkness. In fact, all she really sees in the landscape is light. And yet, most of us completely overlook the light of pure knowing, the light of consciousness, which illuminates our experience. Just as the, the sun's light renders all objects visible, so consciousness renders all experience knowable. Indeed, all that is ever truly known is the knowing of experience, the consciousness of experience. We ignore the only thing, which is of course not a thing, that is ever truly known, in favour of that which, as I hope to demonstrate later, is never actually known. In other words, not only is 
consciousness the prerequisite for all experience and the, the primary element in all experience. In time we will discover that it is the only element of experience. So let us just take some time to explore the, the nature, having, having recognized the presence of awareness or consciousness, let us take some time to explore its nature. All experiences appear and disappear, but consciousness remains consistently present throughout all experience and remains over when any experience disappears. It is as such the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and everything in between. It is the eternal in the temporary. All experience changes, but consciousness always remains the same. The consciousness or the awareness with which we are aware of this experience, our current experience, is the same awareness with which we were aware of our experience two minutes ago, or two days ago, or two years ago, or when we were two-year-old children. Consciousness is, as such, the, the changeless factor in all changing experience, the knowing element in all that is known, the ever-present in the always-changing. Consciousness is always in the same pristine condition. It is never, it is never aged or modified or tarnished by experience. In fact, consciousness is the only element of our experience that never disappears. The reason why experience is felt as one smooth, continuous flow, rather than a series of intermittent and disconnected experiences, thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, perceptions, and so on, is because these are, they are unified by the presence of consciousness. Just as a movie is not experienced as a series of fleeting intermittent images on account of the presence of the screen from which it derives its seeming continuity. In other words, what we consider to be continuity in time is in fact the ever-presence of consciousness perceived through the narrow slit of a human mind. The, the awareness with which we are aware of our experience does not share the characteristics or the qualities or the limitations of whatever we are aware of. The known is dependent on consciousness, but consciousness is independent of the known, just as a movie is dependent on the screen, but the screen is independent of the movie. Our thoughts may be agitated, but the awareness with which they are known, although intimately one with them, is not qualified by them. Thus its nature is peace. Our feelings may be characterized by a sense of lack or dis-ease, but the knowing with which they are experienced, although 
utterly permeating every part of them, is not conditioned by them. And being free from any sense of lack, its nature is said to be happiness. Thus, peace and quiet joy are the very nature of the awareness that we essentially are. Not a, not a peace or a happiness that are dependent upon what is or is not taking place in our experience, but one that is prior to and independent of the content of experience. It is the, the peace that passeth understanding. However, awareness is, is not only the, the knower of the known, the witness of the witness, the, the experiencer of the experienced. It is also the, the medium within which all experience takes place. It is obvious that thoughts and feelings take place within awareness. But it is not immediately obvious that the, the sensations and perceptions that constitute our experience of the body and the world also take place in awareness. When I was a, a child, I would lie awake in bed, wondering how far physical space went on. Whilst there was obviously a limit to everything that appeared in space, I could not find or even imagine a limit to space itself. What about the, the space of awareness within which all experience arises? Try to find an edge to the field of awareness within which your experience takes place. We, we believe that awareness has a border or an edge only because we believe it to be contained within the body and our feelings simply conform to and substantiate that belief. But this belief does not stand the scrutiny of experience. If we stay close to the evidence of experience, the body and world are experienced as a flow of sensations and perceptions, all contained within awareness. But please understand uh, that I'm not suggesting that all there is to the world is the content of our finite mind or even the sum total of all finite minds, that would be a, a slippery slope to solipsism. I'm suggesting that everything appears in awareness, which is itself not limited to an individual mind or even the sum total of all individual minds, human or otherwise. Indeed, the individual mind is one such appearance within the infinite field of universal awareness. Whilst awareness is the, the innermost aspect of our self, at the same time it has no personal qualities. It is the essence of our self, but sharing none of the limitations of our objective experience 
it is impersonal, unlimited, or infinite, utterly intimate, but at the same time impersonal and infinite, imminent and transcendent. So let us just do a, a quick experiment. If I were to ask each of you now, are you aware? I trust that each of you would pause and answer yes. What happened in the pause between my question, are you aware? And your answer, yes. You became aware of being aware. You became conscious of being conscious. Now, when I say you became aware of being aware, I do not mean to imply that you are one thing and awareness is something else that you are aware of. No. Only awareness is aware, only consciousness is conscious. And therefore, only awareness itself can have the experience of being aware. In other words, it is not we as a person who are aware of being aware. It is we, awareness, that are aware of being aware. In other words, awareness is self-aware. Awareness is self-aware just as the sun is self-luminous. Consciousness knows itself just by being itself, just as the, the sun illuminates itself just by being itself. And therefore, just as it is not possible for the sun to cease illuminating itself, so it is not possible for consciousness to cease knowing itself. So when I ask the question, are you aware? You do not pause and become aware of being aware, but rather you, awareness, cease directing the light of your knowing, that is, attention towards the, the content of experience and you, so to speak, come back to yourself. You recognize yourself. That is, you, you disentangle yourself from the content of experience. The knowing of your own being, the awareness of being, ceases to be veiled by the awareness of objects. So, consciousness never ceases to be aware of itself, but its awareness of itself is, in most cases, so, so thoroughly mixed with the content of experience that it ceases to know itself as it essentially is and knows itself in a, in a modified form. And the best analogy I know to illustrate this is that of an actor, John Smith, who plays the part of King Lear. John Smith always knows himself as John Smith, but his knowledge of himself is mixed with King Lear's thoughts and feelings, and he, he seems, as a result, to cease knowing himself as John Smith and to know himself instead as King Lear. But even then, he never really ceases to be John Smith. He just believes and feels that he is King Lear. In the same way, the primary and essential nature of our self, pure consciousness, becomes mixed with and 
seemingly qualified by the content of experience. The infinite becomes or seems to become the finite. The eternal appears as time. Peace is obscured by sorrow, love by conflict. So let me try to relate this to the perennial non-dual philosophy that underlies and is expressed to a greater or lesser extent in all the world's great religious and spiritual traditions. I said at the beginning that I would give two definitions of consciousness, or rather one evocation and one definition to evoke the recognition of consciousness within us, I suggested that consciousness is that which knows or is aware of our experience. And if we pose the question, what is it that knows or is aware of our experience and resist the temptation to answer that question with a word, our attention is gently invited away from its contents and in most cases gradually, occasionally, suddenly, it sinks back into its source, the presence of awareness from which it arises. And this, this sinking of the mind into the heart of awareness is the, is the essence of meditation. Uh, it is the, the highest form of prayer. However, I would uh, like to try to take a, a more philosophical approach now, perhaps less experiential, at least to begin with, but one which, which addresses the relationship between consciousness and reality. So having tried to evoke or precipitate a taste of consciousness in our own direct experience. Let me, let me suggest a, a second part to my definition. Consciousness is that, uh, consciousness is that reality whose activity appears to us as the universe. I first intuited this as a, a seven-year-old boy when I apparently said to my mother that I thought that everything was God's dream. But as often happens, this, this early childhood intuition was eclipsed, and perhaps necessarily so, by the challenges of growing up. And I later had to to reclaim it through uh, introspection and reason. What does this imply in practice? That what we perceive as a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves is, in fact, the activity of a single, homogeneous and indivisible whole whose nature is, is consciousness, spirit, or, or love. Is this simply a, an abstract philosophical idea? I would suggest not, for, for two reasons. One, that I, that as I have already alluded to, all that is, or could ever be known by anyone is the knowing or the, the consciousness of experience. Even, even God, whatever exactly God may be, could only ever know the knowing of whatever it knows. 
thus knowing is all that is or could ever be known and what is it that that knows this knowing only that which knows could know knowing in other words only knowing knows knowing in other words all we can be sure of is that there is knowing knowing only knowing now, if we want to build a model of reality, does it not make sense to start with what we know for sure, the one given fact, the ontological primitive of nature, namely consciousness, and only resort to something outside of and other than consciousness if our model cannot accommodate everything that we experience within it. And I would suggest that we get a hint of the nature of reality every time we fall asleep at night. When we dream at night, our own mind, which is a, a homogeneous, albeit, limited field of consciousness imagines a whole world the dreamed world within itself however it cannot perceive the dream world directly in order to perceive the dreamed world the dreamer's mind must overlook or forget itself and localize itself within its own dream as an apparently separate subject of experience, from whose perspective it perceives its own activity as an outside world. From the perspective of the character in the dream, the dreamed world is outside of and other than her own mind. The name that she gives to the stuff out of which this world outside of herself is made is matter and everything inside herself her thoughts images feelings perceptions and so on she refers to as mind and everything in her seems to everything in her experience seems to corroborate this view when she closes her eyes, the world she sees, uh, that is the dreamed world, although of course she does not know that it is a dreamed world, disappears. And when she opens them again, it reappears. And she reasonably concludes from this that whatever it is that is seeing or knowing the world is located just behind her eyes in her brain. And from this basic assumption, she builds a model of consciousness located in, limited to, and derived from the brain. Now, uh, the dreamed character would never question her model of reality but for two experiences, suffering on the inside and conflict on the other, on the outside. Little does she realize that both experiences, the suffering and the conflict, are the inevitable consequence of her belief that the consciousness that she essentially is, is limited by the body, contained within it, and destined eventually to suffer its unavoidable fate. Of course, when she, when the dreamer wakes up, she realizes that the entire dreamed world was simply how the content of her own mind appeared to itself from the localized perspective of the dreamed character 
that she seemed to be within her own dream. Let us consider the, the implications of this possibility more deeply. Imagine uh, one who uh, has a fearful disposition in everyday life. And she falls asleep and dreams that she is being chased by a tiger. In other words, what was inside her as mind in the waking state, that is her fear, appeared outside of her, the tiger, in the dream state, that is matter. Her thoughts and feelings in the waking state appear as her environment one level down that is, in the dream state. But what if we go one level up from the waking state? Consider the possibility that what appears to us as our environment in the waking state is in fact a dream state for universal consciousness. That is, the universe as we know it is in reality how universal consciousness or in religious language, the mind of God, appears to us from our limited and localized perspectives. In other words, consider the possibility that the same pattern that we observe in dreams is taking place in the waking state, one level up, so to speak. In other words, consider the possibility that, that a universal consciousness is, so to speak, dreaming or imagining the universe within itself. And this would correspond to the, the Logos or the Word in St. John's Gospel. And simultaneously localizing itself in the form of each of our minds, through whose agency or from whose perspective it perceives its own activity as the universe as we know it. In other words, the universe as we know it results from the interaction of two segments of reality, the universal and the individual. Just as the dreamed world comes into apparent existence when the dreamer's mind interacts with a part of itself, namely the dreamed character. Why is it necessary for universal consciousness to overlook or forget or ignore itself in order to bring forth manifestation within it? Why cannot universal consciousness simply perceive the world directly? Because to do so would require viewing the world, indeed viewing the universe, from every possible point of view within it, which would result in innumerable images superimposed one on top of the other. In other words, total darkness. In order to see an object, it is necessary to do so from the localized perspective of a single subject. As such, consciousness localizes itself within itself in order to actualize what lies in potential within it, in form. It gives birth to existence within itself in the form of the subject-object relationship. However, this comes at a price. Consciousness brings forth manifestation within itself by overlooking or forgetting itself, by, by collapsing or contracting into an apparently separate subject of experience. And in doing so, it loses touch with its innate peace and joy. It sacrifices itself for the sake of its creation just as a mother sacrifices herself to bring forth her child. 
consciousness pays for manifestation with its own innate peace and happiness. And it is for this reason that the longing for happiness, peace and love burns in the hearts of all people. What we really seek is not an experience to be added to us. What we really seek is to be divested of all that makes us feel that we are temporary, finite selves, separate from one another, separate from nature, separate from God, and returned to our natural condition. Let us return to the question of the relationship between the universe, the finite mind and consciousness through the, through the lens of a, of a well-known question. Does a tree in the forest exist if no one is perceiving it? I would suggest that this question cannot be satisfactorily answered because it is founded on a false premise. Namely, that the tree exists as such when it is being perceived. But suspend the idea that the tree has its own standalone existence. And consider the possibility that what we perceive as a tree is simply the way a particular segment of the activity of universal consciousness appears when it interacts with another segment of itself, namely the finite mind. In other words, uh, the world as we experience it is the result of an interaction between infinite consciousness and the finite mind. And this is, I believe, what William Wordsworth was referring to in his poem, lines composed above Tintin Abbey, in which he writes, Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive. Well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. We half create the world in the sense that we impose the limitations of perception on its reality. We half perceive it in the sense that its reality exists independently of each of our minds and precedes its being perceived by us. So what we really see when we look at the world is its pre-existing reality, infinite consciousness, modulated by our finite mind. The world as such owes its reality to infinite consciousness. It borrows its appearance from the finite mind. Notice that Wordsworth does not imply a turning away from the world, as do so many religious and spiritual traditions. He has penetrated through nature's appearances and recognized its reality, and then sees those very appearances shining in and as that very reality. As he says, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, 
and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. It is also what uh, William Blake, another of the great seers of the Western tradition, meant when he said, Every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight, enclosed by the senses five. That is, every object is an immense world of delight, that is, of the of the nature of pure consciousness, which is peace and joy itself, filtered through or enclosed by our faculties of perception. It is perception that reduces the infinite to the finite, or, or more accurately, makes what is truly infinite from the localized perspective of each of our minds as the infinite. Makes, makes what is truly infinite appear as the finite. Uh, as William Blake said on another occasion, when the doors of perception are cleansed, everything will appear to man as it is infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through the narrow chinks of his cavern. The narrow chinks of our, ca of our cavern are the, the limited faculties of our senses. Our senses are, as such, not a, not a clear window onto reality. They mediate reality through their own limitations, conferring onto reality the limitations that properly belong to the human mind, rendering reality in a way that is consistent with the limitations of that mind. Divested of the limits that sense perception confers upon reality, reality shines as it is, infinite. And in human experience, the infinite shines in the form of peace, joy, love and beauty. And this is the world that artists want us to see. And the world is not what we see, it is the way we see. And the, the artist is a function in humanity whose purpose is to show that way. Remember the story of uh, Turner returning one evening from his work on Hampstead Heath and one of the local residents approaches him and asks to have a look at his, his painting, his day's work. And after surveying it for some time, he says, uh, Mr. Turner, I have lived in Hampstead for 40 years, but I have never once seen a view on Hampstead Heath like that. Uh, to which Turner replies, no, but don't you wish you could? It's exactly the same vision that William Blake writes of in a, a vision of the last judgment. When he says, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation. And that to me, it is all hindrance and not action. What? It will be questioned when the sun rises. Do you not see a round disk of fire somewhat like a guinea? Oh, no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We do not think of objects because they exist. They seem to exist as such because we think of them. Perception fragments the whole and makes it appear as a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves. And thought then abstracts each of these entities and confers upon them their own apparently independent existence. 10,000 things. But as uh, Ian McGilchrist said on a conversation I recently heard a beautiful 
succinct observation relationships are prior to relata. That is, we think that things first exist and are subsequently related to one another. In reality, it is relationship that brings things into apparent existence. I say apparent existence because in the final analysis, there are no things. But this is not a nihilistic view. I am not denying the reality of things. I am upgrading it. In Pasolini's words, I am restoring to reality its original sacred significance. There is just relationship, relationship of the whole, within the whole, to the whole, never admitting the existence of anything other than the whole. Things, selves, individual selves, are just how the whole appears from our localized, limited, and ultimately illusory perspectives. All the great religious and spiritual traditions speak of this identity of the inner and the outer, of the infinite with the finite. I and my father are one. That is what I am on the inside, mind, and the ultimate reality of the universe on the outside, matter, are one two different perspectives on the same infinite indivisible reality whose nature is consciousness, spirit, love, beauty, peace. Why is it referred to as love? Because as human beings, love is the experience of our shared being in relation to people and animals. When we experience our shared being, in relation to objects and nature, we refer to it as beauty. Thus, love and beauty are the very nature of reality. Or we could say that the experiences of love and beauty are intrusions of reality into our normal dualistic way of perceiving the world. They are portals through which we step out of time into eternity. Nirvana and samsara are identical. The objectless consciousness we know as the essence of ourself on the inside and the reality of appearances on the outside are a single infinite and indivisible whole. The amness of selves is the isness of things. Form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Every tradition, indeed every person that has intuited or recognized this unity that underlies the apparent multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves, speaks of it in their own unique way. In the end, it cannot be accurately spoken of. And yet, there is nothing more important to speak of. We do not speak of it in order to describe or define it. We speak of it in order to evoke the recognition of it. Even that is not quite true. In the end, we, we speak of it or express it in some way simply because we are compelled to do so without having to know how or why. So, I'm sorry, I've just noticed the time I've got carried away and um, having told Niall that I probably wouldn't speak for more than half an hour. So my apologies. Um, but I think there are a few minutes left. Um, so I'm so sorry to have um, overshot my time, but 
if there are a few questions, uh, I'd be very happy to, to respond. Herbert, I don't think you need to apologize. That was that was incredible. So I don't think anybody minds. Um yeah, we've had we've had a few questions. So I'll just invite the first one. It's from Ben, Ben Spalos. Ben, I know you've asked quite a few questions. So um I w how would you ask? I think the first one you asked about the difference between awareness and uh consciousness. So um I'm just gonna invite you into the room here, Ben. So just give me a second. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, hello, Ben. Um, so, yeah, I asked a couple questions now. Do you, is it okay if I ask a question on choice? Yeah, no problem. We probably only get time for one, so I would go for that okay. one, yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, like, one consistent aspect through experience is, like, this, this awareness or consciousness, right? Um, but uh, Viktor Frankl argued that also, like, um, the last human freedoms could be taken away except for... Uh, um, someone's ability to choose their own attitude, to choose their own, to decide ben, their own. Ben, ben ju just speak slowly, Ben. I'm not hearing you clearly. It's more difficult with your mask. Just, just, just keep going, but speak slowly. Yeah. So, so, yeah. What did Vic Victor Frankl say? Victor Frankl mentioned how uh, consistent through experience as well, there's a man's ability to choose his own way, like the last of human freedoms to choose their one's attitude in any given circumstance. And so I was curious if like that can be seen as a consistent part of experience as well with consciousness is personal freedom or choice. If that makes sense. Yes. What, what, what appears to us as uh, individual freedom or choice is the, the innate is the quality of freedom that is innate in consciousness that is consciousness consciousness is freedom and our feeling that we have individual freedom is a reflection of consciousness's nature of freedom in our individual minds so uh, the the belief and the feeling that we have free will is partly true partly untrue it is true in the sense that what we essentially are is infinite consciousness whose nature is freedom. And we feel that freedom. That is why all human beings, without exception, love freedom, because we all love our true nature. What is not true about our belief in free will is that it belongs to us as a person. Ultimately, there are no individual entities in reality, either to have free will or not. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, we probably get time for one more question. So the next one is from uh, Marco. So Ben, I'm just going to turn your uh, camera off here. Um, okay, so Marco, I'm just going to invite you into the room here now. Marco, you might need to switch your, your microphone on, if you can. Hi, Robert. Uh, Marco, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello, hello, Robert. Great to see you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if we consider the body-mind complex, as they call it in the Eastern tradition, would it be good, uh, true to say that the mind uh, as a, a set of thoughts uh, has a particular role because it is it not only makes addicted to thought, opinions, prejudice. Slowly, also, Marco. Slo slowly, Marco. Sorry about that. Would it be right to say that if we consider the body-mind complex, the mind uh, uh, has a particular role because uh, 
it not only makes addicted to opinion, fear, prejudice, but also leads to physical compulsions such as drug addiction or other addiction? I'm not sure that I've understood your question, Marco, but let me respond briefly anyway. That um, addictions, drug addictions or, or any form of addiction, uh, is um, almost always comes from um, a sense of lack in us. We feel a sense of lack. Why? Because we feel we are a fragment. We are incomplete. We feel we are temporary, finite, limited. We don't recognize our identity as unlimited consciousness. And because of this feeling of being a fragment, incomplete, we seek to complete ourselves through the acquisition of an object, a substance, uh, uh, an activity, a relationship. And when we acquire the object, the substance, when we have the glass of wine, the cigarette, whatever it is, our sense of lack does indeed briefly come to an end. And we wrongly conclude from this that it is the object or the substance or the relationship that brought the sense of lack, in other words, our suffering, to an end. And then we go for another dose or shot of it. It's not the object or, or the, uh, the, uh, the acquisition of the object, the substance, and so on, that, that gave us this brief taste of happiness. What happened is that the acquisition of the object or the substance brought our seeking, which means at that moment it brought the mind to an end because the mind uh, it was expressing itself in the form of seeking. So when the seeking comes to an end, the finite mind comes briefly to an end. And in the ending of the finite mind, our true nature of consciousness shines briefly. That is the experience of happiness. But of course, the finite mind cannot know infinite consciousness because it imposes its own limitations on everything that it knows. So it wrongly supposes that the happiness experienced was derived from the substance. And then it goes out again in search of the substance. And in this way, this cycle of seeking, gratification, brief moments of happiness, the old despair comes back, initiates the next round of seeking. We go for the object again, only this time we need a little bit more of the object or the substance to produce the same effect. And hence, addiction um, follows. So ultimately, what is the, um, the remedy for this addictive behavior? It is to recognize uh, the nature, the essential nature of our being, which is peace. Although for one who is addicted to a substance, this may be too direct a step to take immediately, and some intermediary process may need to be put in place before it is possible to go all the way back to our true nature. So thank you, Marco. Nice to see you. Okay, thank you, Marco. And uh, yeah, that's all we've got time for. So Rupert, I just want to say on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for taking the time today to give this presentation and all you shared with us. Um, the, the feedback on the chat has been incredible. So you've, you obviously, you've touched a lot of people here today. So, so well done. Um, before you go, before you go, have you got any parting words for the audience or any, any sort of thing you'd like to share? Um, well, uh, perhaps I know, I, I don't need to, um, apologize again so perhaps i should just say thank you for for bearing with me as i as i got carried away um uh, it's it's my uh, the, the nature of reality has just been my 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 one passion for the last 45 years and and as some of you that uh, know me know i could just talk forever about it so thank you um all of you for for bearing with me thank you all of you for your love of truth and, and thank you um, Niall and, and, and your team for inviting me and, and uh, um, it's been a, a pleasure to, to, to be with you all today and to participate. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Rupert. Um, so everybody else, we're back at uh, 4 p.m. UK time for our final talk of today with uh, Annie Murphy-Paul. So we'll see you guys all then and I uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed this one.